Hello everyone, my name is Korazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world on another rainy day, and I checked the weather again, and it's going to rain, well, for a little bit longer and then clear up, and then we only have a brief window of sunshine. And the way I do that is you can go into the console with enter, and type in slash when will it stop raining. Hit enter, and it will tell you how long you have till the rain stops, and about how long the rain will stop for. So, little tip if you wanted to know when the rain's going to stop, and it's still wet in your world, that's how to do it. Anyway, I'm here because I made a whole bunch of lamellae molds, as promised. Because in order to make one suit of metal lamellar armor, you need to have 19 pieces of lamellae. And I figured, rather than doing them like one or two at a time, we should do like batches of ten. So I made 10, but I need to fire these, and for that I'm going to need a lot of grass and a lot of sticks. And while we have almost a stack of grass somewhere up here, and we have almost a stack of sticks here, that'll only do, well, not even these six. We need 10 pieces of grass for each of these, which means that 58 grass ain't going to cut it. So we want to get some grass, but we want to get it fast. And for that, our knife just isn't going to do. So, to that end, I wanted to show you another thing we can make with the anvil. And that is... a scythe. And yes, I can hear all of you screaming, Make a saw! Make a saw! And yeah, we'll get to that. Just... just hold your horses. We'll get there. So, we're gonna go ahead and heat this ingot up with a piece of coal and some fire. And we'll give that a little bit of a wait. We'll get our tongs and hammer ready. Ready! And we're going to make a scythe. And here we go. Once again, as a refresher from last episode, we're going to use these different directions to smush these little voxels around here, and fill in all of the green boxes, and then we will split out and remove all of the rest of them. And for those of you wondering how I can move the mouse around while I'm working here without having to bob my head around, if you hold down Alt, you can move the mouse around freely. Or, open up any of your menus. Like, well, this is a bit in the way, but you can move these with this here. I can move it if I wanted to. Or the character menu, like this. Some people prefer to do this way. That way you don't have to hold down a button. But me, I prefer Alt. There we go. All of our green squares are filled in, or cubes. Let's bust out these extra pieces we don't need. And there we go. We have our very hot scythe blade. And I wonder, are we able to actually make this while it's still hot? Oh, we can. Okay. Cool. Nifty. No need to quench, I guess. But yes, yeah, so we're going to get into how to gather grass and also sticks much more quickly. Now that we have a scythe and the shears we made last episode. So with the scythe, come out to any patch of grass and left click once and you will trim the grass. So see it trims it down to the eaten state just like it with a knife. And it will do sort of a little box. It'll do six at a time or up to six at a time. So we're gonna get some of these here and this will rebuild our stash of grass. Now if you click the grass again once it's eaten like this, It'll remove it, and, well, it'll also trim any others that are nearby, but it'll remove the trimmed grass in the normal radius. You can also go into your F menu and switch to Remove Grass, where it will, as advertised, remove the grass while it's trimming it. Now, I want the grass to regrow so we can get some more later, so I'm going to keep just trimming it and moving around so we don't accidentally cut any of it permanently. But there you go. Okay. I think two and a half stacks of grass is enough for now, given that we already have almost a full stack. Let's move on to the sticks, which is why we have the shears. Now, the shears are a much more effective way of... Hello, drifters. Eh, I heard you. Okay. Come on, little friendo. So, the shears are a much more effective way of trimming leaves, because you can do it with an axe, and individually, it's pretty quick with an axe, because the axe has a multiplier on trimming plant and specifically leaves. 
knives are popular for some people, but they don't actually trim leaves any faster, so I don't recommend using knives on leaves. Now, the shears also don't have any multiplier on speed for leaves. However, they do a big bunch of leaves all in one go. Now, similar to the scythe, they will attempt to do up to six total leaves, beginning with the one that you centered on, and then seeking the adjacent leaves from that, as you can see. So this is a much, much, much faster way of getting sticks for making ladders, for doing pit kilns, all that kind of stuff. Also, really handy for clearing out this kind of brushy stuff that wolves can hide in. So if you're trying to clear out an area for building on or just traveling through, I recommend waiting until you get some shears because the axe, while it's okay, you'll be making a ton of them and going through them like crazy. Okay, everyone, I think we have enough sticks for now, too. And, of course, we got some more tree seeds from that. So we'll stack those up in here. And let's go ahead and... I'm going to go ahead and fire this here. And then we'll get on to the next topic on the agenda. Which I'm sure you can probably guess by my inventory. And the fact that all these are very full. That I may have a particular item on the agenda today. That's right, we are going to solve our storage woes today. And we're going to do it with this stuff right here. So to get into more advanced woodworking, I like to make chests for replacing our reed chests here, you need a saw. And we're going to go ahead and make a saw right now. But I'm also going to make a couple other odds and ends. And I think we'll just do all four of these here. There we go. We'll do two, why not? And the reason we're doing all four of these ingots is that some of the recipes for these chests and things have changed since version 1.17. It used to be that in order to make a chest, all you needed to do was take eight boards, put them in a circle in your crafting grid, and bingo, bingo, presto, presto, you got yourself a chest. Oops. I just placed the torch. I meant to do that. However, now you have to have not just the eight boards, but you also now need to have some nails and strips placed in the middle of your crafting grid. And each of these nails and strips represents about one quarter of an ingot. And they can be made out of basically any material, but I recommend going for the cheapest, and well, copper is the cheapest. So that's what we're doing. All right, let's get our first ingot off of here. And the first thing up is the saw. Get this guy out of the way first. And I'm just going to smush all these over here. This side, as usual. And with this little tongue, I like to just push these two up and then over. Makes it a bit easier. And same for this. I like to just walk all my bits across the top here. Some people will like to move all these, like, down here, one by one, and then up. But I find it's kind of, well, it's slower, and it can be a little more wearing on your hammer. And my patience. But we're going to go ahead and split this out. And I'm very careful with these splits here because these ones are easy to accidentally move the mouse and end up hammering out the wrong piece. And there we have our first saw. Saw blade. Stick. Saw. Oh boy, you're going to be our good friend for a little while. And next we need some nails and strips. And we have two options here. We have four and we have eight. However, it's my understanding that the eight nails and strips are intended more for use when you are making them from plates. Because a plate is like a big, flat, single voxel thick piece of material. And these make it easy to just kind of hammer out the things that you don't need. You're not moving anything around. You're just splitting it. However, the four are much easier to do starting from an ingot on the anvil. So we're going to do that. Well, this is a pretty tight piece here, actually. Not much waste. And there we have our very first copper nails and strips. Look at that. All right. I'm going to go ahead and make two more sets of these to give us a total of 12. And then I'll get back to you on what to do with these after that. All 
Alright. All done. And as you may have seen in that little montage there, we did break our very first hammer. So we have a second backup. And you'll notice that when I broke the first hammer, the second one defaulted to the heavy hit mode. I'm not a big fan of that, but there isn't much I can do about it. So I'll just cry, I guess. I'm going to go ahead and we are going to actually get our tongs again. So that we can then drop these into the water. There we go. All good. What's next? Well, we have our saw. We have our nails and strips. All we need next is wood. And we have a little bit left up in one of these here. Here we go. We have some maple logs. So to make our wood planks, we're going to take our logs, put them into the crafting grid, and we're going to tuck our saw in there, and each log will give you 12 boards. So five will give you 60. They do stack to 64, but you can't pull out more than five stacks at a time, or five crafts at a time. Now, boards are ground storable. If you want to store them on the ground, you certainly may. I usually don't because they just take up more room. I mean, I can fit something like, I don't know, 60 boards per block, or I could stick them in here, and I can store eight stacks per block. Okay, so, chests. Chests, here we come. To build our chests, we're going to make a circle of these. You'll see that we have a bookshelf now instead of a chest here. But by putting the nails and strips in the center, we can pull out some wooden chests. And I'm pulling out as many as I can. Now, chests are pretty great. They work just like the baskets. They can be stored at angles and everything, too. And they have 16 storage slots in them. On top of that, if you have the carry-on mod, you can also carry the chests, just like you can with the baskets. But you'll see that you actually move a little slower. I can really feel it now. And if you look at your hunger... Oh, hunger is 100%. That must have been changed. But we do move a little bit slower now that we have this chest on our back. And the chests also take longer to don and doff, or to lift and place. Now, there is something else you can do with chests, and that is you can make labels for them. So if we wanted to make a label for one of these, we'd make a sign with two boards and a stick, make a sign, tuck that into the crafting grid with our chest, and we can get a labeled chest. And this we could put down and say, grab some charcoal as a writing material, and crouch and right click, and we could say, Kurazar's stuff. No touchy. There we go. And now we have a labeled chest. And this label will persist if you pick it up and put it down, so I'll keep that. Now, there is something else we can do with these chests, and that is we can turn them into even bigger chests called trunks. And we can do that by putting two of these chests in our crafting grid, either stacked or side by side. It doesn't actually matter. I think it's completely shapeless. So, yep. And we get trunks. Now, this conversion is permanent, so make sure you want to make a trunk before you make one. I happen to want to make as many as I can. And trunks are even better than chests in some ways. While you can't carry them with the carry-on mod, when you place them and open them, you'll see that we have one chest, two chests, and then a bonus column here. So we don't just have double the chest, we have double the chest plus a little bit. And that comes out to 36 storage slots. And that means that we can store more than twice as many items in the same amount of areas it takes to have two read chests. And that's what I'm going to do while these continue to cook out here, and while our second batch is going, is that I'm going to take some time and reorganize everything in here. I'll put these trunks up on the wall here where the read chests currently are. And then, once that's all done, I'll bring you all back so we can focus on the next thing I want to get to today. And, since I'm making a whole bunch of lamellae molds, and we're really focused on forging and casting right now, I hope we can figure out what that next thing is. Alright everyone, I am back from organizing our belongings, as well as gathering some resources, including some more sticks and more grass, and some more peat from our nearby deposits, several of them. And I also went and trimmed our trees down to, well, stumps. And we now have a healthy collection of wood logs up in this chest. 
Now, I thought I'd take a moment to show you our method to this madness. As far as organization, we are still in the early game, so we are still in kind of throw it where it fits mode. But I am trying to get organized, so I'm not sort of like going through every chest every time trying to find stuff. Over here, we have our metalworking stuff. Over here, we have animal goods. This one is kind of a mishmash of wood and then plantables. So you have seeds for crops and then seed for trees. Over here, we have our sparsely populated stone building materials and other minerals that are not metal. We have our dirt and ceramics. And then we have our mishmash of natural things, from resources to plantables to more plantables, like flowers. And we also have our flax over here. We do still have these vessels that are full of kind of random stuff, books and spearheads and arrowheads and glass. And then we have our curiosities and treasure chest over here with our temporal gears, our money, and some other knickknacks. Now, I am firing up our second set of lamellae molds, and that will round out our set of ten. In our first set, I also did a nails and strips mold. This is from the mod that I mentioned, the nails mod, or nails mold mod. And we'll see if we also get four nails and strips from that, too. Now, those of you who've been keeping track might realize that we don't have a whole heck of a lot of copper here. We only have maybe, what, 15 and change-ish ingots worth of copper? And as I mentioned, we need 19 in order to make our lamellar, the full set. So we're going to have to go and get some more copper, but I also want to get enough to make the nails and strips, prospecting pick, probably another pickaxe because we're down to just the one that we have on the wall over there, and maybe some more ingots. We only have one hammer left, I think. Yeah, we're a little short on copper in general. So we might go and ransack probably these copper deposits here and maybe these here. We'll get some wolf killing done as well. Bring back some more pelts and fat and hopefully, you know, save most of our blood. We'll see how that goes. And yeah, that will be the plan for tomorrow. So, let's get to it. Alright folks, it is morning and we're kind of heading into danger zone over here. Kind of early in the morning. The sun isn't quite up yet. I think it's going to be a bit of a cloudy day anyway. Let's see if we can get in here somewhat safely. Nothing so far. We do have here some parsnips that I didn't touch on before. We sort of looked at them. I said I don't like them, but you know what? I'm going to grab these seeds, and we'll take them home, and we'll plant them at some point. Probably not this year, but maybe next year. And look at that. We got some parsnips, too. Not too bad. I'm going to eat them. They're just like onions as far as nutrition goes. 100 each, just to get them out of my inventory. I'll go ahead and we'll mark this off. There we go. So we have here, ooh. Well, we have a little bit of a pit, so we need to lead any wolves or bears away. We know where to go. But let's try to get in here toward that copper deposit we found. Oh, and there's a wolf right there waiting for us. Let's get our shield out. Come here, buddy. Come and get some. Uh. Gotcha. Alright, that wasn't too shabby. Any more? Alright, let's harvest this guy. I'll probably leave the... the meat and the bones behind. And actually, if I leave that... That will take up the spawn cap for a few more days, so yeah, we'll leave you right there. Let's go ahead and get our little way down in here. And here we are at the first deposit. Let's get right to it. Alright, not bad. Almost a stack. Let's head back up and we'll keep going. Alright, so back into our little way around the woods here. I think we're relatively in the clear. We have some onions, but we don't really need more seeds, so we'll leave them for now. Okay, I think we're in the clear here. 
Let's get to work. Okay, we're up to about a stack and three quarters. That's still a pretty good start, but still only a start. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this waypoint. I'm going to go and head over here and try to knock out these three. We'll see how well I do with that. And then I will meet back up with all of you. We're back at base and ready to start actually working on our armor. Okay, folks, we are back. And I ended up not going to all of the deposits out there because in here we have everything that we've gotten so far. And I only went over to this deposit here and this one here. So I'm going to go ahead and remove these now. And the reason I didn't go to more of them is that one, my pickaxe was down to basically a nub. There you go. And also because between the two of these, I almost doubled the number of chunks that we got compared to both of the deposits over here combined. So I figured we were basically at the end of our mining there for the day, but we're gonna go ahead and get started on making us some armor. Now, if we look at the armor for lamellar, we see here that we need not just some of these lamellae, but also some pelts. We see we have four smalls, or two mediums, or one large, or one huge. And that is true for basically all of these. The head lamellar, which really only wants one pelt of any size. And the leggings, here we go, which want either four small, two mediums, or one large, or one huge. So we're going to go ahead and probably minimize the amount of pelt that we're going to be putting into this, because if we were to use these pelts later for leather making, then we would actually be losing out on some leather if we went overkill on, say, using the huge rawhides for the helmet. So I think what we're going to do here is we're going to actually look at the book again. We're going to go ahead and start making some of these pelts because they're going to take some time to cure. So we can do one large for the body. We can do one small for the head, although we only have one small one. Kind of a shame, but we'll do it anyway. And then we can do one large for the leggings. Now the reason that I'm kind of saying it's a shame to sort of do one small at a time is that one lump of fat will actually do up to four small oiled hides. So we'll just go ahead and do that now. And there we go. So these have to cure. And you'll see this says 0% cured. And they will cure fastest when you are either carrying them or if the bag that they are stored in is placed on the ground like that because this is what's called open storage. But we're going to keep this on us because why not? And we'll keep an eye on these. And there is something else that I want to do as far as curing things, and that is I want to get us a nice bow. We've been using these spears for so long, but I have some plans, and we'll talk about those in a minute, and we're going to need something a bit better than these flint spears. And we have a few options here. We could make a crude bow, because we've disabled the class exclusive craftables, but it has a minus 5% accuracy penalty, and while it's cheap, it honestly isn't very good. It has low durability and low damage. We could make a simple bow, which has a little bit more damage, more durability, and no accuracy penalty. This is okay, and it's also relatively cheap. We can make a long bow, which has 3.75 piercing damage, additional accuracy, and look at that durability. It'll last forever. And lastly, we have the Recurve Bow, which is normally a Hunter exclusive. This has a lower durability than the Longbow, but more damage and more accuracy. And this is the one that I'm going to go for, because this is the, honestly, cream of the crop. And while we normally couldn't craft these, we could occasionally buy them, because they are sold sometimes by the survival goods traders. Now, what we're going to need is a dry Recurve Bow Stave. And to get that, we need to take our saw here. And we're going to put the saw over top a pair of maple logs to get a longbow stave, and then we'll do it again to get the recurve bow stave. And this will now spend some time drying, since it requires zero hours. That's going to take a little while, and it might just be a bug on the display there, but it will take some time. 
Here we go, 0% dried, and drying rate in our container is 1%. Again, requires open storage for the fastest drying. Now, I think it's time for us to go ahead and get our smelting on, so let's go ahead and get to it. Alright, with all that cooling, let's talk about why we are making this armor and all these tools and things. Well, that's because in the next episode, I want to start on our first underground mission. We have very close to our home a whole bunch of different holes in the ground, and they seem to be rife with enemies, but I think it would be fun to go and conquer them and see what treasures and secrets the underground may hold for us. We've already discovered a translocator over across this pond and down in this sort of limestone beach area here. So surely there must be something interesting right under our feet too. Perhaps even over this way we have some more caves down here next to this wonderful, wonderful rift that's forming. We have plenty of drifters that come and greet us out of these caves too. And I think we need to go and make them ours. Anyway, to do that, we're going to want to have some better equipment, including the armor. And also a rift right behind our house. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, game. I love it. But we're going to need to have some armor and some weapons and some other odds and ends, some tools, including the prospecting pick, which will help tell us what kinds of... Oops, stepped on that ingot. But the prospecting pick will help tell us what kinds of minerals we are going to find while we're mining down there. To that end, we're going to be making a falx, which is the melee weapon of choice, a sword, an inward bladed sword with serrated edge on the inside for pulling the gears and things out of drifters. We're going to bring along with us two spears using these spearheads, and I think that since we already have a decent stock of copper arrowheads, I might go ahead and in conjunction with the recurve bow we're going to make here, we're going to also hammer out some arrowheads and bring them with us because I have happened to kill a few chickens here and there and we have over a stack worth of feathers for arrows. I'm going to go ahead and get a second load of copper going so we can finish out this lamellar and then we will put together some armor together in preparation for next episode. Okay, batch two is cooling, so let's talk about the arrows that we're going to bring with us. Arrows come in, just like everything else, all of the different kinds of materials available to you. And so if you look at them in the handbook, we have options between a crude arrow that deals actually less damage than your bow deals and has a relatively high break chance. Flint arrows are the same thing but with a feather, and they are slightly less bad but still kind of meh. I am thinking that we're going to want to do copper arrows because they deal zero additional damage, which isn't great, but at least we're getting four per hit, and they only have a 15% break chance. Now this gets better and better, from 12% and extra one damage on tin bronze, all the way up to steel arrows that deal two and a half more damage and only have a 7% chance of breaking. Now, when you are forging arrows, you have a couple options, and I'll show you what those are once this ingot is heated up. There we go. So, we're going to put this on the anvil, and when we do, you'll see we have two options. We can do six or nine. Now, similar to the nails and strips coming in four and eight, the nine is kind of designed more for hammering them out of a single existing plate, which means you'd be getting essentially 25% fewer arrows per ingot. However, it is perfectly possible to get nine arrows, or arrowheads, out of a single ingot. So we're going to go ahead and do that now, because I think it is just far more efficient and useful than trying to just do six. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to speed it up, but take a look at how I do it.
And there we go. Nine arrowheads from a single ingot. That means we're only going to get probably, oh, I don't know, a grand total of 50 or so attacks out of this one because of the 15% break chance on copper arrows. But being that they are fireable and usable at range, it's going to be much better than using our falcs, which we have in here on a rack somewhere. Here we are. I put our falcs up here. The falcs does 3.8 damage, which is pretty close to the bow, but of course it only does it up close and personal. And you'll see, this is as fast as we can attack. One, two, three. And because we are a clockmaker, we actually deal less than 3.8. We get a 15% penalty to that. So we're somewhere closer around 3.2-ish. But it looks like all of our stuff here is hardened up. So we're going to go ahead and pick up all of this lamellae. In the dark, apparently. And these ingots, and all of these tool heads, and nails and strips, and oh, we're out of inventory space. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Alright, we've got all that. However, our pelts are still only halfway cured. So I'm going to give it another day or so. I'm going to hammer out a whole bunch of copper arrowheads, and then when our pelts are ready for use in our lamellar, I'll bring y'all back. Okay, everyone. Well, it's been a while, but we are back. And it's been a while because while I was out gathering some cattail reeds for our adventure for later, next episode, I was warned that a light temporal storm was incoming, and we survived it. Dave, however, did not appear, so I didn't record any of that. But we did get two stacked temporal gears, and this is the only place I'll ever find two temporal gears stacked. You can't stack them otherwise without a mod, but you can get them stacked two from the double-headed drifters. We also got five rusty gears and nine more flax fibers, which is a pretty tidy reward, I think. But you all aren't here to talk about temporal storms. We are here to talk about armor. So let's go ahead and get our lamellae out. And we will need all but one of these. And we are going to go ahead and make ourselves our very first real set of armor. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. We need you here and three across the top. We have head lamellae, and then we have the body lamellar, where we need this, and then one like this across here, and then a double wide row of that. There we go. And then the legs. Copper, here we go. Once again, we start with the pelt, and there we are. Now, armor can be donned and doffed from the toolbar. So we can go ahead and do that now, and we'll swap out our existing armor. And there we go, we have some copper armor. Are we looking snazzy or what? And we're also a little bit noisy now, too. Listen to this. You hear that? Not super noisy, but it's there. And we're a little bit slower, but not much. We are moving at... 101%, so we're, we're just as fast, actually a little faster than a regular non-hunter, non-clockwork character, but we are slower than our usual 110%. That means that bears and wolves might catch us a bit more, but this armor isn't for wearing around the surface. In fact, I generally won't wear this armor on the surface, because a lot of the creatures that are a big threat here are tier 2 attacks. Bears, wolves, sheep, and so on. And this is only protection tier 1, meaning that this armor will take a lot more damage from the attacks, and it'll also protect against a lot less damage. So I'm going to preserve this armor for our initial underground adventures, and not terribly deep either, because the higher tier drifters also come with higher damage tiers. However, that is for later Corazar to worry about. Right now, I'm just happy we have some snazzy armor. And while it is definitely weaker than the brigandine I usually like to wear, it is definitely cooler looking, I think. Anyway, in the next episode, look forward to our very first underground adventure and our first lesson in how to use the pro pick, aka the prospecting pick. I am looking forward to seeing what lurks beneath our feet and also what treasures might lie in wait. As always, my name has been Corazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.